Are you living with eternity in mind? Most people aren't. Even Christians are living for right now, not for the life to come. And they have no idea what a mistake that is. We need to take seriously what the Bible says about living a life right now that God can reward. Take a quick inventory. What have you done this morning? For God's name, God's glory, God's people, God's kingdom, God's word. What did you do yesterday or, or last week? How in the world would anyone say no to the free gift of eternal life? And yet Jesus says the majority of people who, who ever have lived and ever will live will say no to that gift. We give our life to Jesus Christ. We accept Him as Lord and Savior. We have the right foundation now. Now we can build. And so when God tests our works by fire, all it will do is reveal whether we built with the right stuff or we built with the stuff we shouldn't have built well. There will be tears in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. When we see Jesus for the first time, when we're reunited with loved ones, wouldn't you want there to be tears? There will be tears in heaven, but I want to be very clear. There will not be another tear shed over sin, suffering, or death. No tears for that. Paul says, because we know what's coming for unbelievers, and because we know what's coming for believers, we do everything we possibly can to get people to come to know Christ and to live a life that pleases Him. Back in the late 70s, Janice and I lived in Kansas City. I was the youth minister at the Johnson County Christian Church there. And... Um, they had an NBA team back then called the Kansas City Kings. It's the Sacramento Kings now. And they had a coach named Cotton Fitzsimmons. I'll never forget him. He was a great motivator, a great coach. He also coached the Atlanta Hawks and for the uh, uh, Phoenix Suns. Uh, we were there the night. We were actually at the, at the uh, arena the night that uh, Daryl Dawkins broke his first NBA backboard on the head of Bill Robinson, one of the Kansas City Kings players. And well, Cotton Fitzsimmons, he's a very motivational coach, but, and, and you may have heard of him or known of him, but there's, there's one thing that he's pretty famous for, and that's a, it's a pregame speech he gave based around the word pretend. And his team was getting ready to go out and play the Boston Celtics that night, and he, and he gave them this speech, and here, here, here's what he said. He said, gentlemen, when you go out there tonight, instead of remembering that we are in last place, pretend that we're in first place. Instead of thinking about the fact that we're on a losing streak, pretend that we're on a winning streak. He said, and instead of this being a regular season game, pretend tonight that this is a playoff game, all right? And they, they cheered, and they went out on the court, and they got killed by the Boston Celtics. I mean, crushed. And Coach Fitzsimmons was pretty upset after the game. And one of his players came up to him and slapped him on the back. And he said, hey, come on, Coach, cheer up. Pretend we won. <laughs> True story. True story. You know, there are a lot of people living their lives pretending. Pretending to be saved when they know they really aren't. Or pretending not to care what happens after death when they really do care. The fact is, the Bible says a day of judgment is coming for all men. The great white throne for unbelievers, Revelation chapter 20, and the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, for every believer. There's coming a judgment. Jesus, uh, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Always been God's plan. David Cooper said it well, quote, there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. A reward to be received and a dream to be fulfilled. There's a finish line to be crossed and a calling to be answered. There's an enemy to be defeated and a victory to be won. There's a church to be built and a harvest to be reaped. A world to be evangelized and a kingdom to be established. Those are wise words. This isn't just pretend. But have you ever wondered if it's really worth it to live for God? Or is this all just pretend? 
You know, in the Old Testament, we've already seen Malachi chapter 3, the people said to God, we, we, we serve you and we, we do all these things for you, and yet the evildoers prosper, the arrogant prosper. I mean, it doesn't pay to serve you. Remember that? That wasn't just an Old Testament concern. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. I want to show you a brief passage, Matthew chapter 19. I'll begin reading in verse 27. And here we find some men who have the same concern those Old Testament saints did. But are you ready for this? This time it was the Lord's disciples. Would you stand for the reading of the word? Matthew 19, beginning in verse 27. Then Peter said to Jesus, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Peter, the spokesman for the disciples, was saying, Lord, I mean, what's in it for us? No, we've done all this stuff. I mean, we followed you. We left everything. And, 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 and what's in it for us? Jesus said, Peter, there's a reward for what you're doing. A hundredfold reward. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not all pretend. It's not any pretend in any form, shape, or fashion. There is a real heaven, and there is a real hell, and there's going to be a real judgment, and there are going to be real rewards. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 6, for God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For the past five weeks, we've been looking at rewards, not pretend ones, real ones. And here's what we've learned. Number one, God promises a reward to those who have served Him faithfully. God promises a reward to those who have served him faithfully. Revelation eleven eighteen 18 says, The time has come for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great. Sound familiar? Remember at the great white throne judgment? The gathering was of the small and the great. Those who had committed huge, heinous, notorious sins, those who had just were guilty of the sin of unbelief, the small and the great. At the great white, great white throne, the small and the great are there, but at the bema seat judgment of Christ, the small and the great are there as well. Now, it may not be who you think is great, because today we look at someone who has a, has a big ministry, and they're on television, and they've, they've written all kinds of books, and oh, wow, their reward must be great. No, no, no. Jesus told Peter, for in that day when I give those rewards, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Someone who no one ever knew, they faithfully read the Bible every day, and they faithfully prayed every day, and they served quietly behind the scenes every day, and no one ever recognized them, and no one ever knew them. God's going to change the positions in heaven, and the last shall be first. Number two, God promises a reward for doing good works. God promises a reward for doing good works, Ephesians 6, 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Two things I want you to notice. Whatever you do for God's glory, in God's name, for God's church, to build God's kingdom, for God's people, you're going to get back. That verse says that. Whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. You're going to get it back. The Bible teaches that. Now, that's not why you do it. Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do you do that? Whatever you give here on earth for the work of God, for the people of God, for the cause of God, for his kingdom, whatever you give, that's deposited in your account. You're going to get all that back. 
Some people who have lived like kings here on this earth, they're going to live like paupers in heaven. Why? They spent all that God gave them on themselves. And they're in for a surprise when they get to heaven. That's the first thing I want you to know. Secondly, he says, whether bondservant or free, whether slave or free, whether employee or employer, whether you're the worker or you're in charge, whether you did what you did because you had to or because you did so out of your voluntary free will, it won't matter. There's a reward for that. Thirdly, God promises generous rewards. We just read Matthew 19, 29, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Randy Alcorn said, and I quote, this is a 10,000% interest, a return far out of proportion to the amount invested, end quote. How many of you would like to get 10,000% on your investments? Serve Christ. That's what you get back. Number four, God promises a reward for simple acts of kindness. It's simple acts of kindness. Listen to Luke chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. He said to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Why? Lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. In other words, don't, don't give to people who give back to you and you give to them and they give to you. And it's just this reciprocal giving deal. He said, instead... Verse 13, when you give a feast, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, the people nobody else wants anything to do with because, verse 14, you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Do things for people that there's no way in the world you can expect them ever to give anything back to you. There's a reward for that. Simple acts of kindness, compassion to the needy. And Jesus said, you'll be repaid at the the resurrection of the righteous. In Luke 6, 35, he said, love your enemies. And do good, expecting nothing in return. Lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. God does things for people who don't deserve it all the time. We should too. Number five, God promises a reward for generous giving. God promises a reward for generous giving. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to the rich young man, the rich young ruler, he said, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, 20, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. How do you do that? Give here on earth. Give to God's kingdom. Give to God's people. Give to the work of God, to build the kingdom of God, for the glory of God. So wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that the way to achieve financial freedom and to have treasure in heaven is to give away what I have? No, I didn't tell you that. God did. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, yet comes to poverty. Wait a minute, wait a minute. minute. You're telling me that the more I give away, the more I'll have? No, 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 I didn't tell you that. God did. God did. There's a reward for generous giving. Number six, God promises a reward for good works no one else sees or recognizes. God promises a reward for good works no one else sees or recognizes. Now, I don't have time to read all of Matthew 6, but in verse 4, he talks about giving to the needy. He says, you do that in secret. Your father sees that in secret. He'll reward you. Verse 6, he talks about those who pray to the Father. You get in your prayer closet and you pray. No one sees, no one knows. They have no idea that you pray. God who sees in secret will reward you. Fasting, verse 18, for spiritual purposes, not just to lose weight, although that might help. Spiritual purposes, to, to, to get an answer to prayer, to seek God's wisdom, to know God's will. You do that, nobody else knows about it. Now, if you do it, everybody, you tell everybody, hey, I want you to know I'm fasting today, for, you know. You have your reward, but, but if you do it in secret, nobody knows. God sees that, and he'll reward that. Here's number seven. God promises a reward for those who endure. He promises a reward for those who endure. Those who endure difficult circumstances will be compensated. Hebrews 10, 34, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. People came and stole from them. Since you yourselves knew you had a better possession and an abiding one, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. 
You're not going to lose anything in this life, standing up for Christ, standing up for the truth of God's Word, doing what God has called you to do, but you're not going to get back more than that in the life to come. Now, part of our reward is reigning with Christ. We saw that in Luke chapter 19. Jesus told the parable about the master who told one fellow, one servant who had been faithful, I'll put you in charge of five cities. And another one, he said, I'll put you in charge of ten cities. Revelation 26 says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Some over five cities, some over ten. Revelation 3.11, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. So wait a minute. We were talking about rewards. Now you mentioned crowns. Well, crowns and rewards can be interchangeable. Crowns are a symbol of royalty. Crowns are a symbol of ruling. Crowns may symbolize other rewards as well. You say, well, how many crowns are there? The New Testament talks about five of them. Number one is the crown of life. Given for faithfulness to Christ in persecution or in martyrdom. You, you literally lay down your life for the cause of Christ. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, that's not salvation. That's a reward. You already have salvation. Why would you stand firm for Christ if you weren't already saved? This is a reward. Revelation 2.10, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, it wasn't literally 10 days. He was just saying a short period of time. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Now, again, that's not talking about salvation. You, you, you say, well, I can be saved if I go sit in prison for 10 days. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying if you're faithful and you endure, there's a crown of life. Number two, the crown will last forever. So where's that crown talked about? 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. Paul says, do you not know that all the runners run in a race, run in such a way as to get a prize? They run in a race to get a prize that will fall apart. It'll fade away. But we do it to get a prize, a crown, that will last forever. In the Olympic Games of their days, the sporting games of their days, they would get a wreath, and they would place it on the winner. And by the end of the week, that wreath would have wilted and be worthless. We don't do it for that. We do it for rewards, for crowns that will last forever. Here's number three, the crown of rejoicing. This is the crown for our efforts in winning others to Christ and discipling them. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, for what is our hope, our joy, or our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Philippians 4, 1, Paul says, therefore, my brothers who... I love and long for my joy and my crown. That is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Literally, when we go to heaven, the reward, the crown, will be the people who are there that are there because of of our life, our witness, our giving, our sacrifice. Just like these young families who stood up here a while ago with their children. You may never meet them. You may never know them by name. But you give to build a new youth building. Oh, the children's building's already paid for, so you can't give to that anymore. But, but, and maybe you gave to that, but, but, and those children will be in there. But maybe, maybe it's the youth building that's not even built yet, and one of these little children will give their life to Jesus Christ in that building. And they'll come up to you in heaven, and they'll say, you don't know me, we never met. But there are two things that, that you need to remember. Number one, I was there at that baby day, remember? When you were looking at your watch, I was one of the babies up there. And, and, and you were a little impatient at the time, but when the pastor prayed, you got in there and you, and you prayed and you said, God, really do touch those kids' heart. Well, God touched mine. And you know that youth building that, that you all built, that people said it was impossible, that you couldn't afford it, that people don't do things like that anymore, that you gave to that building, that youth building. And, and, I, and when I became a teenager, I didn't think following Jesus was cool and all that, but I went to an event there one night, and, and in the hallway with one of the youth coaches, I, I knelt on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm here in heaven because of you. Thank you for building that youth building. That's the crown. That's the crown. Uh, number four, the crown of glory. This is a crown given to leaders in God's church. Now, you say, well, I've been a leader in God's church. I had a title. I served for years. So I got a crown coming to me. No, 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 no. This is a crown given to faithful leaders. I don't have time to read all of 1 Peter 5, but in verses 1 to 4, it says that when the chief shepherd appears, but these other shepherds, 
who have been faithful, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. But, but not just for having a title of leadership, but, but, but being a leader who had courageous leadership and convictional leadership and committed leadership. There'll be a reward. There'll be a reward for that, a crown. Number five, the crown of righteousness. This is a crown given to those who have faithfully followed Jesus to the very end. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, it's not talking about salvation. Salvation is not a matter of hanging on. Nobody got saved. Remember when the flood came and they had the ark and all that? Nobody got saved hanging on to the outside of the ark. Did you know that? 40 days and 40 nights. Nobody could hang on. That's the point. The point was you had to be in the ark to be saved. And the New Testament says that Jesus is our ark now. And if you're in Christ, it's not a matter of you hanging on. It's a matter of him hanging on to you forever, and he'll never let go. He says no one can snatch them out of my hand. No, this isn't talking about salvation. This is talking about eternal rewards. Now, John warns in 2 John 8, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. You say, we can lose our rewards? Yes, 1 Corinthians 9 talks about that. Paul said, that's why I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after preaching to others, I myself, I'm not disqualified from the prize. We can lose our rewards. We can have them taken away from us. Remember the parable of the talents, Matthew 25? One man uh, took his talents and doubled it. Another took his talents and doubled them. And the third man took his one talent and buried it in the ground. And the master took the talent from him and gave it to the others. We can have our rewards taken from us. We can seek our rewards from men then forfeit our reward from God, Matthew 6. We can fail to earn them, or we can forfeit them, or have them burned up, 1 Corinthians 3. You need to know, not every Christian will have it said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Not every Christian will have the same treasure in heaven. Not every Christian will have the same level of authority in heaven. It's going to be different. That's why John said in 1 John 2, 28, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed at his coming. Did you know some Christians will be ashamed when they stand before Jesus? You say, well, what would they be ashamed for? Missed opportunities? Missed rewards? Randy Alcorn said, and I quote, Scripture is clear there's a payback in eternity according to what was done during our time on earth and that there will be differences among our rewards in heaven. In other words, our experiences in heaven will not be the same. Obviously, in heaven there will be no conceit, pettiness, jealousy, or unhealthy comparisons, but there nonetheless will be differences in reward and position. We've talked a lot about rewards, but this is the final message today, and it all comes down to this. What do we need to do if we want to live the life God rewards? We have two top priorities. Number one, our first priority is to get our name in the book of life. Remember in Luke 10, we talked about that. The disciples came back and they said, Lord, Lord, it's awesome. Even the demons are subject to your name when we rebuke them. Jesus said, hey, don't rejoice about that. That's nothing. What you should rejoice in is that your name is written in the book of life. Revelation 21, 27 calls it the Lamb's book of life. Who's the Lamb? John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This book, this book of life belongs to Jesus. It's his book. Philippians 4, 3, Paul referred to his fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? The book of life is about salvation. It's about eternal life. And you and I get our names in the book of life when we accept God's gift of salvation wrapped in His Son, Jesus. John 3, 36, Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son does not have life and will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. John 5, 24, He said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. That's our number one priority. Get our name in the book of life. Number two, our next priority is to make sure we're building with gold, silver, and precious stones. 
We're all building on the foundation of salvation, the foundation of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And in Ephesians 2.10, Paul says, For we are, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, in verses 8 and 9, he tells us how we're saved. He says, For as by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our works don't save us. But because we're saved by grace through faith, through Jesus, what he did on the cross, we do good works. But friend, listen, whatever you're building, don't use inferior materials. Don't take shortcuts. Don't, 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 don't. Listen, you're building for you. I heard the story of a builder one time, a large builder who um, came to one of his top employees who was one of the uh, construction managers for projects. He said to him, he said, listen, I got a deal for you, Jim. He said, I'm going to give you half a million dollars. And I'm going to let you design the home, build the home. You choose everything that goes in it. And he goes, this, you, just whatever your dream home is, can, can you do it for half a million? He goes, oh, yeah. He said, well, here's the deal. Whatever you don't spend of that half million, he goes, you can just keep personally. He goes, all right. So he drew up this home and uh, began to build it. He, he poured the foundation. He really watered down the, the concrete and the foundation. I mean, it would still look like concrete and all that, but it just wouldn't be nearly as strong. And, and did turn out once later, they did have a structural uh, problems with the house. He, he didn't use new lumber for, for the studs and the, uh, and, and the two-by-fours and all the, the two-by-tens and everything he put in the house, the plywood. He, he got recycled wood that had been used before, pulled out of old buildings and all that. And, 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 and the roof, he, didn't, he used some new kind of cheap cheap tile stuff to put on there. All the appliances he put in the house, he got the cheapest ones he could get. He put in cheap doors, he, he, I mean, uh, floor coverings. He got the cheapest stuff he could get. I mean, it would look good for, for a few weeks, but it wouldn't last but just a few months. And, and he had it all finished. And, and so the, the day came and the boss came and, and, and said, I want to see the house. He pulled up in front of it and it looked incredible. And, 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 and Jim said, listen, I, 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 I didn't spend a, a bunch of that money. He goes, hey, that's okay. You can keep all that. And he said, and by the way, this is your house. Here's the keys. <laughs> don't, don't build with inferior materials. Don't try to take shortcuts. Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Randy Alcorn in his book, The Treasure Principle, says, and I quote, if you imagine heaven as a place where you will strum a harp in endless tedium, you probably dread it. But if you trust Scripture, you will be filled with joy and excitement as you anticipate your heavenly home. As I've written elsewhere, heaven will be a place of rest and relief from the burdens of sin and suffering. But it will also be a place of great learning and activity, artistic expression, exploration, discovery, camaraderie, and service. Some of us will reign with Christ, Revelation 20, Faithful servants will be put in charge of many things, Matthew 25. Christ will grant some followers leadership over cities in proportion to their service on earth, Luke 19. Scripture refers to five different crowns, suggesting leadership positions. We'll even command angels, 1 Corinthians 6. We are given these eternal rewards for doing good works, persevering under persecution, showing compassion to the needy, and treating our enemies kindly. God also grants us rewards for generous giving. Jesus is keeping track of our smallest acts of kindness. He said, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Alcorn continues, by clinging to what isn't ours, we forego the opportunity to be granted ownership in heaven. But by generously distributing God's property on earth, we will become property owners in heaven. End quote. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 19, to encourage those who are rich in this present world to be generous, to give, to share, to help those who are needy. Why? Because they're building a foundation for the coming age. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, I don't, I don't box like a man beating the air. I beat my body daily and make it my slave. Why? I want to be disciplined. I don't want to lose my rewards, Paul said. It's a true story. Henry Morrison and his wife had been missionaries for over 40 years in Africa. They were coming home on a ship from Africa to the United States, and ironically, President Theodore Roosevelt and his delegation were on that same ship. When they docked in New York City, the president was greeted by a huge celebration and a, and a giant delegation. There was no one there to greet the Morrisons. 
And after everyone left the ship, they were among the last to get off, and they actually had begun to feel a little resentful, to be honest. And I think you and I could understand that. And Henry Morrison said to his wife that he'd been thinking about what he wanted to say to God. He said, I was going to tell him, we're servants of the Most High. And we've served you faithfully for over 40 years on the mission field in Africa. But when we return home, there's no one here to greet us. And yet those who serve in the political realm, not the spiritual realm, who serve men in the needs of this earth, when, when they come back, there's, there's a huge welcome for them. But he said, honey, just as I was getting ready to say that, it was almost as if the Lord said to me, Henry, you're not home yet. Let me leave you with this challenge. Will you commit yourself today to live a life God rewards? Let's pray.